Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Hope you had a fantastic weekend. Uh, it was a really, really good weekend for me. Enjoyed a little bit of my hobby. Kind of kicked back and relaxed just a little bit. Uh, this is a great time of year for the car hobby. Uh, buying and selling parts, you know, that, that type of thing. Anyway, I appreciate you being with me. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. And this is what I call the morning musings. Well, we, we're studying the parables of Jesus, and specifically now, we're looking at the nature of the kingdom as taught by Jesus in his parables and throughout the rest of the Bible. And the reason we're doing this is because all three of the futurist views on eschatology say that one day, when Jesus comes out of the sky as a five foot five Jewish man, that <clears throat> the physical creation is going to be recreated, renovated. We're going to have better bugs, slugs, and mosquitoes. <laughs> Everything's going to be different physically. Well, I don't believe the Bible teaches that kind of the restoration of all things at all. And I think when we look at a contrast between the, <clears throat> between the Old Covenant Kingdom and the New Covenant Kingdom, that we can see very clearly that the materialistic, physical concept of a future kingdom is completely misguided. Now, one of the inherent elements of the literalistic, futurist, and physical kingdom concept is that one of these days, all of Jesus' physical enemies will be destroyed. The dispensationalists have the Battle of Armageddon, a physical conflict. Physical war is intrinsic to the very nature of futurist eschatologies. What did Jesus, or excuse me, what did, what did the Old Testament predict about the kingdom? Well, in Isaiah chapter 2, after saying that in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house, that's the Messianic temple, would be established, all nations would flow into it, and it says, they shall beat their swords into plowshares, for nation shall not war against nation, and they shall not learn war anymore. Wow! That tells us we're never going to have any more Iraq, any more Afghanistan, any more this or any more that, right? No, I don't think that's the point. We have to keep in mind that the old covenant kingdom was established, defended, and spread by the sword. How did Israel possess the land of promise? Joshua was the conqueror. They capture, they destroy, they burn city after city after city. Look at the exploits later of King Saul. Look at the exploits of King David. <clears throat> The nature of the Old Covenant Kingdom was that it was obtained, it was defended, and it was spread by the sword. But a fascinating thing happened as Jesus is led out to his crucifixion. He asked his disciples. Now remember, he's been teaching them for three and a half years concerning the kingdom, right? They're all fired up about the kingdom. He is their king. And he asked them, how many swords do you have? Well, Lord, we, uh, let me see here. Uh, oh, yeah, we got three swords. And Jesus goes, that's enough. Really? Would that be near enough in the materialistic, physical concept of the kingdom? In which we are told that when Jesus comes again, he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. He, th he will slay them with the sword of his mouth. 
Jesus said, no, three swords are enough. And then, when Peter took a sword and cut off the ear of Malchus, Jesus rebuked him and said, put up your sword. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. But Lord, we've always defended the kingdom with the sword. And yet, here is Paul saying later, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. The weapons of our warfare are mighty through God, casting down every imagination, bringing every thought captive to the will of God. But they're not mighty through man. They're not mighty through strength of man. And thus, when Paul could say to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 6, put on the whole armor of God. Okay, time for battle, right? Time for war. No. We do not struggle against flesh and blood. The nature of the king is spiritual. The nature of the kingdom is is spiritual. Jesus does not rule with a physical rod and a physical sword. And it is not the will of Jesus to put a bullet in the brain of those who dissent against him or to keep his own subjects in line. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of peace in which we have relational, covenantal peace with Him. And the kingdom is no longer obtained, defended, and spread by the physical sword, but with the sword of the Word of God. Hey, look, in my book, Like Father, Like Son, on Clouds of Glory, I have an extensive discussion of the nature of the kingdom. It is critical to understand the nature of the kingdom. Go to my website, eschatology.org or bibleprophecy.com. Order the book. Mention that you saw the offer on YouTube or Facebook, and I'll refund your shipping. Thanks so much for joining me for this morning's Morning Musings. We have more on the nature of the kingdom, so we'll see you on the flip side.